Welcome to another episode of Help Jamise Banks Change the World. I'm Jamise Banks, here with my co-host, Thomas Griffith. This month, we welcome two guests who are going to talk with us about health care and health disparities. But first, like we always do, we'll have that change the world moment. Take it away, Thomas. Meet eight-year-old Peyton. When Peyton learned about a family member who was struggling with homelessness, she immediately wanted to help. While researching on what she could do personally, she discovered that homelessness is a big problem for a lot of people, especially children. It was then that she decided she was going to start an organization to help make the lives of children much more enjoyable. That organization became known as Eye of a Child. One of the main goals of Eye of a Child is to throw birthday parties at homeless shelters across the U.S. Their mission is to keep children smiling and having fun during a time of mass uncertainty. Let's give a big shout out to Peyton and wish her much success with her mission to help change the world. And now to our special guest. Today, we have two amazing guests. Together, they have written hundreds of articles, appeared in books, have patents, have talked about health and advocated for health equity around the world. And so we are so excited today to have a conversation with Dr. Willie Underwood and Mr. Curtis McManus. When I had the opportunity to speak with each of them, um, I'll just have to confess, I wanted a policy person, but I also wanted a medical doctor to be able to talk about our topic this month, which is healthcare. And when I talked with Dr. Underwood, I started by talking about the food groups and all of those things we think about when we think about our doctors and our health. And Dr. Underwood said to me, well, yeah, but I think about health in a different way. I think about why it is that we have four liquor stores and no grocery stores in our community. I think about how people can't get access to health care. And so Dr. Underwood has dedicated his career and his life to health equity. And in a minute, we're going to hear from him and also Mr. Curtis McManus. My conversation with Curtis about the amazing work he is doing in his church, his God-led work. And it's sort of interesting how each of them have been inspired to make a difference because of the direction that God has led them in. And so I'm happy to have a conversation today with these two gentlemen who are changing the world in terms of health. So Dr. Underwood, tell us a little bit about what you do and why. Well, why I do it, it's because I believe that this is my purpose in this world. This is why I'm here. What I do is that, you know, my daughter said, you know, when I think about being a physician growing, growing up, I don't think about you. Right? So, so what does that mean? So, yes, I practiced medicine for over 20 years as a urologic surgeon. But the real answer is this. When I wrote my personal statement, I said I wanted to help people. So how can we help people? And I wanted to improve the health and the health care of America, but specifically and especially black America, right? Because we died disproportionate from disease. So what do I do? I, everything I've done is about that. So from research and looking at health equities, disparities, looking at prostate cancer and why men get treated or don't get treated, that's around improving their outcomes. In the policies things that I do, I sit on the board of the American Medical Association. I chaired their council on legislation and we look at policy of how things are done. Uh, that's sort of what I do. When I now the executive director of Buffalo Center for Health Equity, and we're looking at the east side of Buffalo that has a 300% higher mortality rate, which is all primarily black, that's greater than the city, the state, the county. You know, this is ridiculous. And why those things exist? Let's end that, right? Enough is enough and too much stinks, right? I sit on the board of an insurance company. Why? That's a major thing around healthcare delivery. So how do we affect insurance companies so that we can improve the health of people, especially those who have been disenfranchised? Nutshell, pretty quick. That's sort of what I do. 
two things hopped out to me in that. You know, we're in the COVID, should we get the vaccine question, right? And of course, that hits the African American community harder. And you talked about research. Um, how do we get African American communities to understand what we need to do to protect ourselves and to be prepared in these situations? So it's interesting. I, I think we know, right? I mean, we, we sort of know what to do intuitively, right? The question is, how do we have the opportunity to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So, so when it, regarding the vaccine, people say, should I get it? I say, well, that's something you should make that decision. I should not make that decision for you. My job, since you asked me the question, to give you fair, honest, open answers and asking those questions to the best of my ability. I can tell you that I got the vaccine and why I got it because even though, you know, I got it because the risk of dying from the disease is greater than the risk from the vaccine at this point. And that if we do find out that they have done some shenanigans around the vaccine, then all hell is going to break loose. So I think in this case that the sh shenanigans are less likely compared to the shenanigans that has happened in the past with all kinds of issues of health care and health care delivery, because those things were done in the dark. This is done in the light, so to speak. So the less likely that these sort of things, will, will, you know, would happen. Now, you know, our job as a people is to live healthy, strong, to create wealth, to move us in a positive direction. The Bible says that we're supposed to leave an inheritance, not for our children, but for our children's children. So mm -hmm. our job is to do that among many things, but that's our responsibility. So if it means that I, for me to do that, I need to live to be 111, then I need to live to be 111. So that sort of is an amazing segue into what um, Curtis McManus does, right, his church. Um, so Dr. Underwood has talked to us about the why. Um, your clinic, your volunteer staff clinic is about the how we can do some of those things. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do um, and about your clinic? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. I can tell you that uh, when I took my early retirement from Eli Lilly and Company, it, it wasn't my plan to start a free medical clinic necessarily. Um, my plan really was to spend more time with my wife and my children, given I traveled extensively around the world. And in that travel around the world, from a, from a, a volunteer standpoint, I spent a lot of time in the country of Haiti. I led medical teams to Haiti for over 20 years. And um, one day I said to our pastor that joined us, I said, you know, um, we are making a difference in Haiti. And, and what folks loved to see in Haiti was that they saw us, where they had never seen people of color, particularly African-Americans, as a medical group coming in to serve them in, which, in, in, in the way in which we did. So we were making a difference. And then so I said to the pastor, why don't we explore if there is a need for what we do in Haiti in Indianapolis? And um, I partnered with a PA friend of mine who has a master's in public health, and I said, um, who also joined me in Haiti, I said, uh, do you believe there's an opportunity here in Indy? And she said, I do believe that. Um, but to a person, she and I and another, and another colleague, a physician colleague, said, let's not have an emotional experience. Let's make sure that if there is indeed a, a, a need for free medical care in Indianapolis that's done differently, let's partner with, this, with the IU School of Public Health to have them do the research to determine if there's indeed a need. They came back and said, sure enough, in the Pike Township area, there's nothing like what you are proposing to do there currently. So with that, having experience in Haiti, having the data, we then moved forward to establish a free clinic. We, we went to Trinity Free Clinic in Carmel, which uh, was founded by their church, uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So with that as a model, um, we then said our church will be the founding, founding organization 
of our clinic. Our church is Solid Word Bible Church, a small non-denominational church of about 200 people um, with many professionals in the in our church. Um, we we moved ahead, started this clinic that began um, that opened the doors on June 30th, uh, 2018, uh, to only one patient. Um, and we thought that uh, perhaps we did not do enough market research to meet the needs of the community. Ultimately, um, we uh, we indeed uh, did the right research, and today we are we're we're providing mostly acute care. So, uh, and then as we have grown, we are finding ourselves providing care for those with uh, chronic diseases, namely hypertension. Uh, pulmonary problems, and, um, and diabetes. Both of you all have traveled outside of the country. And when you look at what's going on outside of the country and come back home, are there any parallels or any things that you all can say you're seeing similar going on in our country right now? Well, let, let me jump in and, and say, not only have, we spent t- have I spent time in providing medical care in Haiti, but I've also spent time in Africa, um, in Ghana specifically, and then on the Navajo Reservation. Um, As you know, the Navajo Reservation and our Native American reservations are separate countries within our own country. And what I have seen from a disparity standpoint is very similar to what I see here in the U.S. Um, Lack of access, um, I'm seeing uh, hypertension as a as a common problem for those people in, in Haiti, those people in Ghana, the, Na- the Native Americans on the Navajo Reservation. Um, I see drug abuse. I see depression. I see hypertension. So I'm actually seeing a very similar um, disease model regardless of where we go. Navajo Reservation, Haiti, Ghana, right here in the U.S. Yeah, I mean it's the same. So because we catch hell everywhere we go. Yeah. All right. I mean, exactly. you know, so 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 it's interesting. You know, the scientists said, "Oh, it's a genetics thing and this thing." Other, no, it's it's the fact that we catch hell everywhere we go, and our diseases are the result of that of 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 hundreds of years of oppression. Right. There you go. And that and that and th- and that's now we're now realizing that we're now talking about it. It was interesting that the research started in England around the social determinants of health because uh, Michael Marmot, who's now Sir Michael Marmot, they knighted him, the queen knighted him, because he noticed that when you looked at those who were work employees of the government who all had insurance and all had access to health care, that the higher you were on the ladder, the healthier you were, mm-hmm. right? And those who had low-level jobs suffered from more disease and died from disease earlier compared to those at the top of the ladder. So he said, wait a minute, you know, we all have access to the same things, you know, what's going on? And when he started looking at, well, these people control their, their life better compared to the lower levels and all that. So let's look at us. Generally, we don't have control over our, our lives because we're, we're, we're either colonized, slave, slaverized, and all kinds of arised, right? You know, for hundreds of years. So, 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 and this is sort of what we have to really understand. And we have some options here, right? We can continue on this path, or we can say, you know what? God didn't plan this for us. The devil did. Let's change our direction, change our path, and let's come together in collective ways so that we can improve our our life, our health, our wealth. You know, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. And financially, right? Because those are the things that will give us opportunities to live long. Well, what I'm hearing is is that, you know, we're all agreeing, we're in agreement, but obviously one of the problems is education. How are we able to reach out and educate the folks that we're talking about to come in and utilize the services that you guys provide? I'm, I'm going to say the education is twofold. I mean, what I heard is interesting. Brother, what you've done is amazing. But but this is I'm gonna this is what I heard right, two hundred people. You didn't say you're in a church of two hundred thousand, right? Right? You said two hundred people. So that tells you what collectively we can do, right? Yeah. Collectively we can do. Here's our vision, right? Yeah. 
here are resources, the minimal at the time, right? But we got vision, we got God, we got our hands, we got our feet, we got resources. We're going to build this thing step by step. We could take one step, God takes two, right? Yeah. And we're just going to make this happen. So we can do that in any arena that we decide to do it in. And you don't have to have thousands of people, right? right. You just say, you know what? I got three friends. I'm going to educate them, okay. right? They got three friends, right? So what we're going to start doing is moving this, the mindset, the mind change. As a man thinketh in his heart, so shall he be, right? So how we think, what we do, how we do it, right? And then God will do the rest. Once we change our minds and our ways, okay. God does the rest. So, Mr. McManus, then that brings me to another point. Uh, you said that you all use a template from a, a, a church in Carmel, Indiana, I believe. So now you're doing it in Indianapolis on the far west side. Are there any other churches that are emulating or talking to you about copying exactly what you're doing? Um I would say no. Some of the churches, the ones that we've spoken with, they have felt callings in different areas. Okay. They have felt callings in um, building a uh, an, an economic, um, um, it better environment for folks. So they're building apartments, they're building homes, they're build, they're creating credit unions for folks. Some have created schools. Um, so the medical aspect of this has not been their calling. It's 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 our calling with our 200 people. Um, but no, I, I can tell you along the lines of your question, uh, many of our patients are are Nigerians. OK, and many of them are Yoruba. In fact, the vast majority are Yoruba speaking Nigerians. Um, one of them came to the clinic and said, sir, I need to ask you, why do you do this? And at the time we were. Um, we, 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 it was before COVID, so we had a waiting room, and I would always go out and introduce myself as president, CEO, and find out how they heard about the clinic. And he said, I need to ask you, how, why are you doing this? And I said, is that a question for me specifically or the clinic uh, in particular? Mm -hmm. He said both. So uh, I, I told him the story, how it came about, and he said, sir, you need to know that the church that I belonged to in Nigeria there were 10,000 members. We didn't have a clinic, mm -hmm. but the pastor was, was taken care of with a jet and, and the like. And um, so I, I can't believe that you, you're doing this with this few number of people and you're doing it for free. So he said, so I'm not paying anything. I said, your medications are free. The service is free that we're doing. This has been our particular calling um, can't speak to why your church in Nigeria didn't see this as their vision, but this is ours. So a lot of the churches that we have spoken with and worked with, they um, they have different callings. For example, again, um, and I'm going to cite New Corinthians Church, a beautiful church, great community involved church. Um, they allowed us to come alongside of them to provide the education you talked about on COVID-19 on diabetes, on comorbid diseases, on vitamin D3 and why vitamin D3 is important um, from a health standpoint for us in particular uh, to help ward off uh, this disease. So we're coming alongside of other churches as an educational arm, if you will, um, with our team. So um, Dr. Underwood, back to your point about the collectivism um, and uh, Curtis's church with only 200 people being able to have the kind of impact and Thomas's point about education. How do we get back to that collectivism? How do we get to the place where we take a collective interest, we use the skills and talents of people in our communities to do this kind of work? And also, Curtis, your thoughts on that as well. So, I mean, it all goes to how we were taught, right? It's a programming that has gone on starting from slavery and, and Willie Lynch and thinking about how to keep a slave, right? And in the book, he talks about the fact that if you teach them this stuff, he's talking about us, you know, thousands of years from now, they'll be still doing the same thing. So this is a program, you know, something has always 
hit my mind. I always thought about this. People say, well, black people can't work together. I don't understand. I say, yeah, because you keep saying black people can't work together. <laughs> I mean, you know, you keep saying it, then we can never do it. But if you and I work together, then black people are working together. I'm black, you black, we working together, so black people work together. I mean, it's just sort of like things that we don't sort of, you know, connect to. And that's why I pointed that out, 200 people, right? We don't need the masses. So let's let's look at and again I you know again I'm I'm not a minister but but I but I think about the the scripture right so so when when and we don't need everybody we just need a critical mass you know when Moses sent the twelve um, tribal leaders to look at the promised land ten of them came back and said you know the land is great is everything God said but we all stone Moses to death and go back to Egypt because we don't want to take on the giants right it was two so when I work with people. I don't worry about the 10. I'm looking for the ones and twos, the Joshua and the Caleb's, right? You give me some Joshua's and Caleb's, we can, we, we're going to take the high ground. We're going to make this happen, right? Yeah. And when people don't want to join me, I'm cool. Mwah, love you. God bless you. I salute the divine within, but I got, I got two cats over here who wants to rock and roll, so let's <laughs> rock and roll, right? So Because and if we just focus on that, the, the masses will join. They will f- come on board when they see successes, right? So we again, we make a step. God makes two steps and let everybody else follow if they want to. Let those with ears hear and those with eyes see. And if you're blind, crippled and crazy, then that's on you. That's not on me. So, Curtis, what are your thoughts? Like I started this podcast in much that same vein, that anybody um, who wants to can collect and get things done. Helping Jamise change the world isn't about Jamise. It's about what happens in your orbit, right? How can you be inspired? How can you join with others? How can you make an impact? Um, so what is your thought about how we do this collectivism, particularly since you've been able to accomplish that um, in your church? It's, it's interesting. Um, you build it and they shall come. Um, just two weeks ago, I got an email from the medical director of the Pendleton Prison. Uh, in Pendleton, Indiana. Um, she's a Japanese uh, American. She said, I have been uh, researching free medical clinics in um, close to my home. She lives in Zionsville. She said, Your, yours was the first to pop up. And I was incredibly impressed with your website, your Facebook page, and what you're doing for the community. And I'd like to join you. Uh, do you have any conditions? And I said, yes, you need to love our people unconditionally. You need to be competent in what you do. You need to demonstrate leadership and you need to demonstrate patience. And then if this is all about you, you're not for us. I said, you know, the, the, the name of this clinic is the Rafa Free Clinic. That's from Exodus 15, where God says, I am the healer. And that's what we want everyone to understand. This is not about Curtis McManus, my team. This is about our Lord and Savior and loving people unconditionally. We then built this not only after the the, uh, Carmel Clinic, um, Trinity Free Clinic, but then there, uh, Dr. Underwood, there is a a Lawndale um, up in Chicago, Lawndale, built a community and in that community they built a clinic and uh dr john perkins and and wayne gordon wrote a book and that book is called making neighborhoods whole Mm -hmm. so that is helping us foundationally as to how and when we move forward as a church and as a clinic so we've we've identified not only a medical need here We've identified that people need legal help. So from a vision standpoint, we're going to have a, 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 a legal clinic connected to our clinic. We're going to provide mental health services. We're going to, we're going to expand such that we will help this, this whole community become a, a better community, more effective community. And we could care less about your color or your ethnicity we care about, do you love Christ? And are you going to love and serve people based on how Christ wants us to love and serve people unconditionally? The least of these. There you go. 
Uh, well, well, I have a question in that regard. You know, hearing all the things that you all are doing, nothing is absolutely free. There's <laughs> well, somebody had to invest something monetarily. Obviously, you're investing your time, and your efforts, and your knowledge. Are there donors or or sponsors or folks that have helped you out? And I'm not trying to get you to identify them, but is that part of the the, the process to make this happen? We will not accept any money from the government mm. to tell us how we should care for our patients. Okay. Um, the vast majority of the money that we get, um, in fact, all of it comes from donors. Let me just tell you a quick story. Um, and I don't mind giving this the name of this individual because, um, you know, we named one of our rooms after he and his wife. But he simply heard about what we are doing. And he said, I'd like to make a donation. And I said, OK. Uh, and I, I happened to know the guy, but I didn't really know the guy. You know, typically, we as people don't ask each other what we do for a living. <laughs> uh, that's just that's just not us. So and this guy is not an African-American, but I never asked him what he did for a living. So he uh, said he'd like to make a donation. And I assumed it's going to be a 100 bucks or so. My marketing director called and said, Curtis, are you sitting down? And I said, yes, Paul. He said, we just received the largest donation we've ever received um, by a Dr. Finneger. And I was blown away. That He said in his donation, my wife and I would like to help jumpstart the clinic. And indeed, it did. So he had never been here. He walked through the doors and he said, oh, this is a real clinic. And we said, oh, yeah, this is, this is top-notch class. We're not going to do anything that God would not be proud of. So that money combined with someone who said they want to remain anonymous was a significant donation. And then many people within the church have donated. And then this past year, the United Way, um, we applied for a grant, um, COVID-19 related grant. They then gave us a significant donation to allow us to buy an EKG machine to provide to buy uh, thousands of uh, vitamin D3 to administer to our community and other medications. Uh, so I would say that, and in fact, I know for sure, every penny we get comes from people that have caught the vision and want to give towards that, including our board. We have a board of, of nine people and they all give faithfully as well. Dr. Underwood, you sort of work in the opposite, like you work with public policy, right? Is that a bigger challenge um, than just taking the donations and not the government money? Are you, or what's our uh, secret sauce, if you will, for um, dealing with the policies that we know um, work against us and have traditionally worked against us? Yeah, it's hard. You got to be patient. Um, and you sort of, the rule that I have, you you know, you know, you you ask the person who can do it and not the person who can't. Oftentimes, and what I mean by that, oftentimes someone will go to to one legislator and they're pushing something forward and the legislator never tells you that's I can't do that. That's not something I control. You know, you go into the mayor crying about something that comes from the federal government. You know, it doesn't work that way. You go to the governor and the governor doesn't control it. So that's key. Like who actually controls it? Mm -hmm. And also, secondly, is also understanding that there's a law and then there's regulations. Right. And it's the regulatory people that determine how that law will be implemented. Right. So oftentimes you can focus on dealing with the regulatory people and not dealing with the legislators themselves. Right. And then secondly, understanding really what your leverage is and, and how things really work. Yeah, we got votes. We don't have any money. Legislators care about money, right? You know, and understanding that, understanding what wealth provides for people and, and, and how do you leverage wealth and leverage opportunity and resources. You know, you if you spend all your resources on things, then you don't have those resources to do things. Right. And they say, what do you mean by that? I do to do things. I drive a car I buy this. And no, I'm talking about do things. That means that that means that it is a talk that I give the, the young people. I say, look, you know, every politician has a red phone. And they say, you mean, I say, you mean like the Batman? I say, yeah, they got a red phone. Right. And that red <laughs> on the other end, that red phone is some rich person. Right. Okay. I said, so you, you know, you protest on the street 
And this is how this really works. Rich person calls red phone. And then whoever you call it, they don't no aid answers that phone. They answer the phone. Yeah. And they say, look, uh, I'm watching the news and I saw that a young man was killed by the police. This is bad for business, bad for my company, and I want this handled. Click. Okay. Now, the legislator says, we're calling the district attorney. We're going to call in all these people. I want that officer dealt with immediately, right? And then it's set, right? You know, they all of a sudden, they end up in court. They're convicted. They're in jail forever. And, re you know, there's none of this other stuff that happens, right? Because you know, so until we understand how business is really done and do business the way it's done, we're going to be in the situation that we're in. That's profound. Uh, it, it seems really simple, um, but it's a really complex thing for us to get to the place where we fully understand how to play the game and fully engage, right, um, in playing the game. So I'm getting the signal that time is almost up. It's oh, been no. amazing. <laughs> um, this happens to us in every episode. Like we could talk to our guests all day long, um, but we want them to hear from you and not us. So I would ask each of you um, to give your parting thoughts. Uh, you know, we want people to be inspired. We want people to um, get into doing the things that they can do in their community in this regard, whatever that would be. So if you could give us your last thoughts about how we can have um, individually and or collectively impact um, in this area of being overall healthy in every possible way. For, for me, um, one of my quotes that I live by, um, it is better to receive recognition without getting it than to get recognition without earning it. Um, so I, I love when we are, we are giving back in such a way that it's all about Christ and not us. And who cares if we're getting recognition? Um, so I, I, I live by that. And I encourage my team to live by that. And it's been it's been a great, great way for us to move forward. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Underwood, your parting thoughts. First, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be on this show. Brother Griffin, Sister Banks, this is awesome. You know, Brother McManus, thank you very much for everything that you're doing. You know, I often you know, think about this. Like, let's not focus on what we can't do, because if we focus on what we can't do, then we won't do the things that we can do. So let's do the things that we can do, right, no matter what it is, right? So we're talking about exercise. If all you can do is walk around the block, then walk around the block. I mean, you don't talk about I can't run a mile. They see me running every day. They go, oh, I can't run. I'm like, just walk around the block. If you can walk around the block, right? If you can walk the refrigerator back, walk the refrigerator back, right? If you, can, if you can put two people together and we can begin to build a building, let's build a building, right? It doesn't matter. Just do what you can do and don't worry about what you can't do. Take one step and let God take two. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been an amazing blessing. Um, I know that I will be engaged, although um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that free clinic. Um, <laughs> Curtis expects to see me doing something, right? Um, and I hope uh, we'll have each of your bios and information um, on YouTube. I hope everyone will check that out. Um, Dr. Underwood and his work around prostate cancer. Um, and diseases that are urology related. Everybody, every man, every woman needs to know and understand what's happening with that because that's something else we can do. Um, so we want to thank you both for being with us um, for this episode, for the work that you do um, in the community just to help um, change the world in your corner of it, wherever you are. Um, so thank you for being with us today. So Thomas, do you feel healthier? That was such an amazing conversation with Dr. Underwood and Curtis McManus about how they are working with their communities to make all of us healthier and living in a healthier environment. You know, as a black man in America, when you see brothers that are doing positive things, all it does is inspire you and make you wish that you could spread all that same kind of love all around the country. Yeah. Well, if you couldn't find a way to help Jamie Spanks change the world in this episode, I don't know how you will. But you'll get another chance because next month we'll have Karen Freeman Wilson and Amina Pearson 
talking with us about urban development and helping Jameez Banks change the world.